Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Visualizing Nutrition Data for Decision Making. What have we learned so far? My name is Riley Auer, and I'm the Communications Coordinator for the Data for Nutrition Community of Practice. A few housekeeping notes before we get started today. Microphones are muted during the presentations. Please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen to connect with other participants or to contact me for logistical support. Please share questions for our speakers using the Q&A feature and indicate which speaker you are directing your question to if possible. We will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session and answers to all of the questions as well as copies of the presentation will be shared in the community's event page in the week after the webinar. A recording of today's webinar will be immediately available on the Data for Nutrition YouTube channel. If you are experiencing technical difficulties, you can contact me for logistical support by using the chat feature and selecting all panelists, and I will do my best to assist you. Today's webinar is hosted by the Data for Nutrition Community of Practice. Data for Nutrition provides members with opportunities to share knowledge, experience, and questions relevant to strengthening the nutrition data value chain at all levels for the purpose of achieving better nutritional outcomes in low and middle income countries. We are proud to say that our community has 790 members and we're still growing. Mr. Augusta Flori will serve as today's moderator for the Q&A. He is a recognized global nutrition leader with over 20 years of experience delivering social and economic change in Africa, the Middle East, Asia, through philanthropies, international organizations, and businesses. He is a results for developments, managing director for nutrition. Today's panelists are Mr. Sean Baker, Dr. Melanie Renshaw, Dr. Pranima Menon, and Mr. Paul Noonham. Sean is the first ever chief nutritionist for the United States Agency for International Development. Before joining USAID, Sean worked with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as the director for nutrition, adding to over 30 years of experience supporting nutrition in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Today, he will be speaking to his experiences as a prospective donor to share what donors hope to get out of investing in nutrition data visualization tools and how to make those investments as effective as possible. Melanie is a Chief Technical Advisor of the African Leaders Malaria Alliance, also known as ALMA. Today, she will share her experiences supporting decision makers and the strategies she and her team use to engage African heads of state. Pernama is the Senior Research Fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute and a member of the DataDent team. She is a theme leader of South Asian nutrition programs in IFPRI's Food Poverty, Health, and Nutrition Division. And she is, directs the partnerships and opportunities to strengthen and harmonize action for Nutrition in India Initiative, also known as POSHAN. Today, she will be speaking to her experiences developing the POSHAN District Nutrition Profiles and considerations for indicator selection. Paul is the director of the SDGT2 Advocacy Hub. As an advocate, Paul works with stakeholders in food, agriculture, nutrition, and climate to generate momentum and action needed to end malnutrition in all its forms. Today, he will share his thoughts on when and how data visualization tools can support nutrition advocacy efforts. Today's webinar highlights work from the Data for Decisions to Expand Nutrition Transformation Initiative. DataDent aims to transform the availability and use of nutrition data by addressing gaps in nutrition measurement and advocating for stronger nutrition data systems. It is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and implemented by three partners, the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, the International Food Policy Research Institute, and Results for Development. Ahead of today's discussion with our esteemed panelists, Dr. Yashoda Arana will share best practices and learnings from data dense work on data visualization tools for nutrition, also known as nutrition DVTs. Yasho leads the data practice and nutrition team at Results for Development and the Data Dent R4D work. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Yasho to share what we've learned about nutrition DVTs thus far. Yasho, over to you. Thank you so much, Riley. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. 
It is a pleasure to share best practices and lessons for data visualization tools in nutrition. Based on our portfolio of work, as Riley said, conducted under DataDent, an initiative funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and implemented by three partners, Institute for International Programs at John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, if free and results for development. Next slide. First, what is data visualization and why should we care? Data visualization is the process of graphically displaying data to tell a story. So you may ask, why do we visualize data? Data are more persuasive as graphs compared to tables. The human brain more rapidly processes visuals compared to text. And this is especially important for policymakers and decision makers who have limited time to engage with a lot of data. So data visualization tools can be useful for decision making, advocacy, and communication. To just give an example, one of the most common examples of DBT in our day-to-day -day lives is in fact a car dashboard. There is a lot of data about how a car operates, but what you see in the dashboard is very selective, informing priority actions, decisions that you as the driver need to make. But dashboards are, of course, not only the only DVTs out there. There are different types of DVTs, such as scorecards, indices, profiles, um, among others. Next slide. So now that we have this background, I will share eight key consolidated recommendations stemming from four key work streams on DVTs in nutrition that we conducted under DataDent. Very briefly, the first was a review of existing global DBTs in nutrition, where we examined how they contributed to the nutrition landscape. In the second week work stream of user research, we unpacked the context of use of global DBTs in nutrition and identified strengths and challenges of existing DBTs. Third, we conducted an online survey of nutrition data use and needs by both global and country level stakeholders, which included their use of global nutrition DVTs. And lastly, we were also able to complement these global findings with country level work. That is, in India, we worked with our IFPRI colleagues and completed a landscaping of DVTs. And in Nigeria, we're closely working with the Nigeria Governors Forum to develop a nutrition scorecard for the governors of Nigeria's 36 states. We encourage you to go through the DataDent website, for which the link is also provided in the presentation, to access the rich findings from these individual studies. But for the purposes of today's presentation, I will be presenting consolidated recommendations across this body of work. Next slide. So recommendation one, there are many global nutrition DVTs already exist. So ensure that any new or an improved DVT has a unique value add. Next slide. There are a growing number of nutrition DVTs. And when we conducted our landscape analysis, we found 22 as of 2019. But our online survey showed only a select few appear to be accessed by a number of nutrition stakeholders. So as you can see from this slide, of the 177 nutrition stakeholders who responded to our survey, majority of them accessed a few global nutrition DVTs. Since DVTs need both time and funding to develop and maintain, we recommend both developers and funders to outline the unique value add of their new DVT being considered or how the existing DVDs are contributing to, their land, to the unique value add when they're undergoing refinement. Next slide. Recommendation two. So once you've determined the need for a new DVT or to refine an existing DVT, please ensure that the DVT has a clear theory of change guiding its design and use. Next slide. 
In both our global and country work, few of the tools that we reviewed had a focused theory of change. So what do we mean here? They often lacked a clear target audience and or focused on informing a specific set of actions for that specific audience and a pathway of how the tool leads to change. All of these three are critical elements that can help ensure that the DVT is ensuring the use of data by key stakeholders and is also translating into action. One of the few exceptions um, we've included here is the case of the African Leaders Malaria Alliance, ALMA scorecard, which is often lauded as a successful DVT because it includes a focused theory of change with a very targeted set of decision makers. So in this case, the African heads of states that it is supporting. Actionable indicators that align with their agenda. So you have actionable indicators that are coded with action loops, used of color coding, upward and downward arrows to show progress, as well as recommended actions are provided to facilitate action. And lastly, a strong engagement strategy with their targeted decision makers. So heads of states are provided with quarterly reports on progress and meet regularly as part of ALMA. So the DVT just doesn't exist there, but there is a mechanism in which the DVT is brought to attention to, the, uh, to that of the decision makers. And there might be other strategies in addition uh, that Melanie, one of our panelists, may elaborate on. Next slide. Recommendation three. So once you have a clear theory of change, include actionable indicators that align with the DVT's theory of change. So if we go back to our cardboard, uh, car dashboard example, its usefulness is in providing the driver with actionable information, not just information on whether the car is working or not. Next slide. So in the case of nutrition, DVTs could still include more actionable indicators to support decision making and not just outcome indicators such as stunting and wasting. And here are some examples include namely around the enabling environment, enacted legislations and coverage indicators. To just briefly elaborate, one of the most obvious gaps are coverage indicators for interventions, which makes it very difficult for decision makers to know what coverage gaps there are, where, and so where do they really need to prioritize their attention? These actionable indicators can be shortlisted, especially through consultations with the key stakeholders that the DVT is planning to target. Next slide. Recommendation four. So when selecting indicators for a DVT, especially the ones that are actionable, Please be mindful of how the definitions compare with other indicators already in use. This recommendation stems from two observations based on our review of indicators across DVDs, again, both at the global and country levels. Next slide. So first, in few cases, we observed that differences in definitions of coverage indicator, coverage interventions can lead to different and confusing results. So just again, as an example, what you see in this slide is that of Bangladesh, where we were looking at diarrhea treatment coverage for children, which differed across DVTs based on whether the children received oral rehydration salts, zinc supplements, or oral rehydration salts and zinc supplements. Next slide. Second, we found that some DVTs use different indicator definitions and methodologies for similar domains and measures, which may send mixed messages to users who are going through these DVTs quite rapidly. So again, as an example, what you're seeing in this slide are three different DVTs that are cracking political commitment domain for four different countries. On the left, you see the traffic light ranking of WHA targets in nutrition plans by the sun meal, with blue being between green and red. In the middle, you see the ranking of nutrition targets and their quality by the Action Against Hunger scorecard on measuring progress towards ending malnutrition. And then on the right, you see the political commitment ranking of countries by the Hunger and Nutrition Commitment Index. 
And so if you see for any of these countries, the traffic light ranking very significantly across these tools. Now, this is just an example. And of course, the indicators and methodologies are different. So it's not necessarily right to compare these tools ranking. But the issue is that they do operate more broadly in the same domain, that is the political commitment domain. And so for, for, uh, for target audiences who don't have enough time or who are going through these DVDs quite rapidly, they might send different messages. Next slide. So once you have a clear theory of change and you've decided on the indicators, be transparent about the data source and ensure that the data are up to date. Next slide. In a user research work stream specifically, the four key challenges identified by nutrition stakeholders included, first, unknown metadata. As noted by one CSO representative, the metadata is the first thing that they go towards, the indicator name, the full definition, the type of data, and it's not always clear from these sources what this information is about. Second, lack of current information. Again, as noted by a donor representative, if you're going to use it, you want to be sure it is continuously updated and hosted by something like FAO, WHO, or the World Bank, where you know that they will be sustaining it. Third, lack of historical data. I would want to look at change over time and what specific changes have been made, as noted by a CSO representative. And lastly, lack of disaggregated data. You don't always get all the extra bits with it, like being able to understand the data by different classifications and different levels of disaggregation. Next slide. So once all the data is selected for the DVT, ensure that you test visualization formats with targeted users to ensure that the format aligns with the user's data literacy levels and preferences. Different ways of displaying data are more or less suitable to respond to, to particular decision needs and data literacy. For example, bar charts can be used to compare across interventions, maps to compare across geographies, color coding for intuitive assessment of statuses, or you can really have key statistics prominently called out when you would like to draw attention towards it. Likewise, we've also seen more complex and dynamic visual formats also being used, but these are generally better suited for highly technical audiences. So in some, when you're packaging data, we would recommend developers to engage their target audiences early on to both determine their data literacy as well as their preferences. Next slide. Along with testing visualization formats, be ready to provide user support to understand, interpret, and use the data correctly. Next slide. As an example of user engagement, we found that DVD producers can provide support to users in five key ways. First, having user guides that can provide users with instructions for how to navigate their tools. Second, trainings which could complement these user guides. Third, WhatsApp groups as a platform, both to engage their key stakeholders, but also answer key questions from stakeholders. Fourth, at minimum, a producer contact information so that stakeholders can ask questions. And lastly, presentations of key data, especially when there is a new round of data so that stakeholders are both aware of the new data, but are also able to access summarized results. Next slide. And finally, the final recommendation is to address broader sector-wide issues with nutrition data availability and quality more broadly that can also constrain the usefulness of global nutrition DVTs. Next slide. So in our online global survey, the three most commonly cited challenges by respondents included the lack of data at the subnational level experienced sometimes or frequently by 82% of respondents, where blue shows the number of respondents frequently experiencing the challenge and green 
those sometimes experiencing the challenge. The second, the fact that the data is out of date, experienced by 77% of respondents. And then the last, the lack of trend data experienced by 73% of respondents. These challenges also impact global nutrition DVTs, limiting their ability in the type of data that they can provide stakeholders. So the usefulness of specific global nutrition DVTs can also benefit from investments more broadly in nutrition data availability and quality. Thank you, and now I'll hand it over to Augusta to lead the panel discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Yasho. This is for this great presentation. Um, you've given us a lot of important insights and, and practical recommendations uh, for you know, anyone interested in, in developing new DVTs, in, in revisiting existing scorecards or dashboards, uh, especially if they're not being used enough, uh, or, or all the funders that are funding DVTs and in a way are interested in, in the value for money of what they do. Um, without further ado, I want to move to our panel, uh, starting with Sean. Uh, but before that, I want to remember uh, our audience to use the, the, the Q&A function uh, for, for questions and, and, um, and the chat for comments if you, if you want to. Um, so Sean, uh, both at the Gates Foundation in your, in your previous job and, and now at USAID, you, your, your, the organizations you're working for um, are working a lot in DVTs and have a long history of funding DVTs in nutrition. Uh, what have you learned from this experience? And what are you looking for in the next generation of DVTs? Um, thanks, Augusta, and thanks, Yasha, for that excellent presentation. Uh, in fact, you probably covered a lot of points that I would have responded to Augustan's questions. I, would, I was actually going to start at something that you said, uh, that Yasha said, that these are data visualization, visualization tools. Right? They are just a tool. And I think this is sometimes where we have failed thinking that, that these visualizations, and I reflect back on all the incredibly good work done by profiles. And sometimes there was this frustration that we've done all these great analyses, developed these great sets of slides, but then action has not happened. But being very clear about who needs to know what? How are we actually going to use these tools to have an influence? What we're trying to influence and do it is so essential. So we can't think that the tools themselves are going to solve the problem. It's how we use the tools. Uh, I think another, some of the other points I think we've learned along the way have been really well covered in the presentation of first and foremost, think very clearly about your audience and what can that, what does that audience need to know? What can that audience consume? And very clearly, what is the action you're trying to get that audience to take? Broadly, if I sit here, so I'll, as you said, since I'm currently with the donor organization and have, have worked with the donor organization before, uh, you obviously need to th think about those people who are authorizing that funding. When I was at the Gates Foundation, that was Bill and Melinda here working for USAID, it's our appropriators in Congress. You know, they are very interested to understand is the money we're putting into this work, is it having impacts? That has to be a pretty clean, crisp message. And uh, you, you really need to boil down the very complex, uh, the complex story into some really compelling graphics that however, and I think Yashu, you pointed this out, that are soundly based in evidence, right? This is not to be smoke and mirrors. It needs to have a very sound evidence base. And then as importantly, you know, as, as a donor organization, while we need to keep our appropriators uh, informed, engaged, we also fundamentally are working, you know, with our partner governments, how are they engaging? How are we getting their uh, attention pay, paid? And so those policy and decision makers in governments with high burdens of malnutrition, what is gonna resonate with them? And I, I was gl glad to see the, and I see that the ALMA scorecard, because I do think also 
the ALMA scorecard and inspired the way the African Leaders for Nutrition, uh, Continental Nutrition Accountability Scorecard was developed, really understanding the audience of heads of states, having it in fact validated by uh, key leaders in Africa and owned is so essential. Um, and I wanted to perhaps, and then of course, you want to make sure that, well, I've, I've pointed out the authorizers, appropriators and the policy and decision makers is to meet key audiences. I see this huge advocacy community as being that huge, a major interface. So you want to make sure the advocacy community has been, can understands those and can use them because they are part of the echo chamber we need to leverage to get policymakers and, and appropriators to, to, to move. I also, and one of the things perhaps I, I wanted to, two other things I wanted to flag is that you also need to think of the visualization tools that are gonna work much more for the technocratic audience because at the end of the day, the technocratic audience will needs to have faith in the data, can deal with much more complex data visualizations and in fact, will be hungry for them. And a lot of these decision makers, of course, are going to pressure test what you presented in a more simplified format with their technocrats. So you need to speak to both of those audiences. And the last point I wanted to make was um, actionable data. And I think, again, a point that was made in the presentation, we focused, I think, so much as a community on changes in status which doesn't change that quickly. Certainly something like stunting doesn't change that quickly. And to me, one of the most exciting changes is now that we have consensus on coverage indicators and that they have been taken up in the demographic and health surveys, they will change more quickly. And in fact, that's what you need to hold programs accountable for. Of These are the critical services we want to offer. Are we actually getting these services to the populations that, needed, that are needed? That to me, as I think, our, our ability to track that report on that in a compelling way, I think can be drive a lot more action than we've seen in the past. Thanks a lot for this perspective, Sean. Uh, and, and great to see that a lot of the, the presentation content is, is, is echoing with your, your experience. Maybe as a follow on, I mean, is there a new DVT, a new scorecard dashboard or existing one that is getting suddenly more attention again that you are particularly excited about? And, and if yes, can you tell us why? Yeah, and I'm not sure I'm gonna to respond exactly to your, your question, but clearly food systems are getting much more traction. And here is a situation where you have a concept that's incredibly complex uh, and it's getting traction in the debate and how do we actually translate the concept, understand the data and translate this complexity into actionable steps for decision makers, particularly national policy makers and of course investors in, in country. Um, we have been supporting the food systems dashboard as one example and we've started piloting it uh, with in, in Senegal and Ethiopia, uh, but I think it's going to be, so I'm excited about it, but I think it's still going to be a work in progress for all the reasons that, that we've talked about. And it is an area where it's an incredibly complex and translating it into actionable steps and given geographies is going to be a real test of can we make, can, can we bring actionable data to decision makers to, to act on policies and programs? Uh, so I'm excited about that. And then, um, I wanted to, I, perhaps a word of caution I wanted to share with everybody, and I'm going to plagiarize a bit what Ellen P. was said, I guess, last week, right, in her Foreman lecture about how do we combine our voices and not have a cacophony of data visualization tools that create disunity. So I think focusing on fewer of higher quality that resonate with the audiences is going to be an important thing. If we had, and I was struck by one of the, the, the slides that Yashu presented of how even visually they seem to be dissonance about reporting on the same things basically. And we can't afford as a community to have that dissonance. Uh, on one hand, we do need to tailor our tools to the specific audiences, but we need to do it in a way that they speak to each other or they speak in harmony. 
otherwise we can we we can appear to be disunited and cacophonous in front of decision makers and that that is not a good thing thank you sean for this this word of caution and i will i, I will leave the the audience with your previous point which is you know translation of complexity into actionable steps um, in given geographies. And I think that's a, a great segue to the Alma scorecard, or I should rather say the Alma scorecards, because there's a regional one and there are some national ones. And so, Melanie, it's a, it's a great pleasure to have you on the panel. You've already been, the Alma scorecard has already been named <laughs> twice uh, in the conversation so far, no pressure. Um, Maybe as, as a first question, could you elaborate um, on the strategies that you and your team uh, have taken to engage head of states and maybe you know, how they've evolved over time? You've, you've been doing this for a while and I'm sure that there has been a lot of learnings. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here today and thank you for the nice things that were said about our scorecard approach. Um, so we, we have the advantage that we were an existing alliance of heads of state and government um, and the Alliance Elma um, was created by the heads of state and government. So clearly that was, that was extremely helpful because it was already owned by the heads of state. We didn't have to create a new forum. We didn't have to create a new opportunity. So we were meeting with them um, since 2009, the heads of state and on the sidelines of the AU summit. So we had a forum. Um, and then uh, through the side event that we had, we ensured strong engagement of the heads of state. And after about seven to eight years, we actually then mainstreamed our agenda into the actual agenda of the AU. So our current chair gives an overview of um, malaria that are reflected priority and impactful indicators. Um, we then selected those indicators through a very broad consultation we made sure that there were clear data owners and the heads of state also asked us to not have any parallel data collection systems. So basically to use existing data that were already out there and to have data owners so that whenever anybody asks you about the data, you refer it to the data owner. The data owner also establish what makes you red, green and yellow in the dashboard. Um, we also though felt it was very important that a dashboard or a scorecard in itself it's not self-explanatory. So that's why we issue to every head of state, every quarter, a country narrative report explaining what the scorecard is saying about their specific situation and also including the recommended actions. So basically, if you have a red, not on track, or you have a, dec a decrease in performance on the equivalent period, last, either the last scorecard or the same period the previous year, you get a recommended action. And that recommended action is specific and time bound and countries, um, sometimes heads of state write back to us, sometimes it's ministers of health or, or directors of programs, uh, write back and let us know what the progress against those recommended actions have been. We get about a 90% response rate on due recommended actions every quarter from across all of the countries in Africa with malaria. And um, so it's really putting more emphasis on the accountability and action part than actually on the data. The heads of state then asked us, um, would you mind helping us um, to actually have these scorecards operating at country level, um, using the same methodology, same emphasis on, on, on accountability and action. So we have now supported 40 uh, malaria scorecards at country level. Um, 29 reproductive maternal newborn child and adolescent health scorecards, two nutrition scorecards, and um, six um, neglected tropical disease scorecards, all with the same approach of country priorities, countries select their indicators, countries um, use real-time data for ours largely from the DHS2, and then they have a web platform through which they can create the scorecards. Um, but then at the same time, there is an action tracker. So you assign actions and responsibilities when you again have a red or a declining performance, bottleneck analysis at country level, identifying the necessary actions and then tracking progress against them. And also a work plan function. So actually some countries have their entire work plan and you can then, if it's not an indicator that can be well described or where the data are not fantastic, you can have an action 
and a work plan function, which also helps to drive managerial capacity and addressing the bottlenecks. And so we've got this mutual reinforcing accountability mechanism going from the regional level through the ALMA scorecard um, through to the country level through this the country owned scorecards and then some down to increasingly to even community level where there's a real focus on quality of care um, and quality of service to service to really create community ownership for health as well and um, we've seen that it leads to action both at head of state level Heads of state don't like to be read in their scorecards, and so they will do anything that they can to go green. And that might be increased domestic resources, policy change, um, procurement accelerations, solving bottlenecks at, at um, national level. But at the same time, we've seen that reinforced through all of the country scorecards where you basically get both political and technical engagement around areas of underperformance, leading to a variety of fixes, which may be increased domestic or partner resources, mentoring, task shifting, increased technical assistance. Um, there's, there's hundreds, well, it's probably thousands of examples that we can give of how these scorecards are leading to action. And um, we, we, in, we in ALMA, um, the country scorecards belong to the countries, but um, they do tend to share their best practices and we are working to have a knowledge hub actually so they can transparently share their scorecards and some of those best practices. But I think I think it's worked because the heads of state wanted and asked for this in the first place. That certainly creates the enabling environment. Um, and then we have had a very significant and in-depth consultation, both with the heads of state, but also ministers of health and partners as well. Thanks a lot, Melanie. This is great. And, you know, I'm hearing a lot of focus on having the right process here. So starting with, you know, uh, yeah. a demand from the heads of states, you know, asking them what they want instead of, you know, kind of developing something that they might want. Uh, the, having an engagement process, you know, having the narrative, the foot on, etc. And, um, you know, processes are not always what the first thing that come to mind when you do those things. But I you know, I think you're telling us very clearly that, in fact, they might be the most important thing for them to be um, to be useful. And also, I, I love, you know, and I really want to emphasize the focus on accountability and action rather than the data itself, which I think is, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's a long term process. And so what you want is accountability and action and, and the data will move with the, with with, the, with more or less lag and the other uh, factors that come to play. Maybe just one follow on for you uh, at this point, you know, what advice would you provide to um, nutrition DVT producers? You've, Alma has produced two nutrition DVTs, you told us. Um, but so, you know, for, 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 for producers, organizations that want to develop new DVTs in nutrition or in food systems, you know, on how to ensure that they, their, their, their DVTs help translate information into action. Um, I think if, if we think about how much time we spend on the data part of the scorecard versus the action part of the scorecard, it's probably about 20% of effort is on the data and then 80% of the effort is on the action. Um, and we, similar to the, um, the color coding that we have for the, for the data, we have color coding for the action. You go red if you don't achieve the action in the time period that it, you were given. And um, you don't, it doesn't ever go away until you've actually addressed it. So um, we use that same traffic like system um, with, the, with the actions that we use with the data. The other nice thing about it, especially if the data aren't changing frequently, the actions change frequently. So that allows the, the tool to remain dynamic because even if the data is only changing, the data are only changing on an annual basis, which is the case for some of the data, the actions are changing on a quarterly basis. You report back on something. Yes, it led to this action. Here's the next action that comes out. So, so it, it, it lets the tool remain, remain up to date and really changing all of the time. So it, it maintains interest. Um, I think the actions have to be specific. Um, we were a bit woolly when we first started. But you can't just say do something about your terrible maternal mortality um, ratio because they, the heads of state would come back and say, what precisely should we be doing? So we learned very quickly that we needed to be very specific and we work with the partners 
who are specialists in that area so that they define what the action would be. We're a secretariat, we're not a technical agency. And so we have a strong network um, across the partnership of who is best placed to give a really good action. And then does it lead to change? Has that led to an impact? And if it hasn't, it means maybe that action in itself was not enough. And so once one action has been addressed, drill down further and come up with another action until you go green and then you can actually drop both the action and, and the indicator. So it's really about as much, no much more, much more effort on good actionable actions that everyone can feed back in, back on and um, keeps the whole process dynamic. Great, that's, that's again a great transition for, for our next panelist, Pernima, um, who's just been involved in developing or supporting a new, uh, a, a new DVT in India. But before we transition, there's a quick question from the audience about which two countries uh, are you supporting with nutrition DVTs? Tanzania and um, Kenya. Thank you very much. So Pernima, um, you've, you know, you've, you've been very involved uh, in the nutrition DVT space in India, uh, from landscaping it to actually supporting uh, the, the, the creation and uh, um, implementation of this new, uh, a new DVT. Um, can you tell us a bit more about, about that exercise and how you and, and, and your team, you know, have uh, supported the selection of indicators uh, to include in the, in the push and district nutrition profiles? And also, you know, kind of how much of time is allocated to the data versus the actions in uh, uh, in the case of Poshan? Uh, thank, thank you, Augustine. So I, I should make a correction. This, this is not a new uh, DVT. Huh? Um, so we uh, first made a little prototypes of these uh, district nutrition profiles, literally by hand and in PowerPoint, I think way back in... Uh, maybe 2012, and I was completely inspired by Alive and Thrive in those days in Vietnam, who had made these two-pager provincial uh, data sheets on infant and young child feeding because Alive and Thrive was working on that, and they were working on it in all the all the provinces, and they just needed people to understand what they meant when they said, you know, infant and young child feeding, all the different indicators and the trends, and I was like, wow, that's that is very neat. Um, and then, you know, simultaneously, I had realized in India that, uh, you know, as a nutritionist and as someone who sort of, you know, breathes sort of the Lancet uh, UNICEF conceptual framework and has sort of grown up on that, uh, that was not intuitive for people. You know, there was a time when everyone was trying to understand the problem of stunting in India. And it was really like um, the blind men and the elephant story. You know, somebody chased one hypothesis, someone else chased another hypothesis. But I think those of us who've grown up, you know, with this idea that this is a multi-sectorally caused problem, realize that it's quite, you know, you have to see the whole picture and then understand where the gaps are to know where in your geography you need to work on this problem. And so that was the, the origins of the nutrition uh, district nutrition profiles that we did. And like I said, we did them by hand. We did uh, 10 of them first, uh, and then uh, three districts in three different states. And then we worked with some amazing partners who engaged people, um, you know, district officials, block officials, even frontline workers around the use of these tools. And we actually have a report that sort of lays out everything that they understood. Um, so, in you know, going back to sort of this issue of the choice of indicators, you know, we were very driven both by purpose and by framework, you know, and the purpose to me was very, very clear. Um, we had to help people see with data, uh, sort of gain an understanding of how the multiple causes of malnutrition were coming together in their geographies so they could understand how, you know, with what was more important where you were working, because this is a big country, a decentralized context, district administrations, district actors, you just can't do the same thing everywhere. So uh, learning about malnutrition and its causes uh, and you know the, the state of the solutions that were in place in terms of the reach of the interventions, et cetera, was a very important purpose. And then you know, we outlined that 
in a framework. And you know, if you see, um, I actually don't remember now if this current iteration of the BMP has it, but that was also when we were working on it at a time in India when there were, uh, and there still of course remain huge data gaps, but we actually had empty bars in some of the places where you would want data because we felt like that was the only way you could create a conversation you know, to say, listen, food security is a big cause of malnutrition, but you know what? There is no data on that at your level, but we're not gonna ignore the fact that the data is not there. There will be an empty bar there to remind you that this is a really important driver of malnutrition and you should talk about it. So that's how we chose the indicators that, you know, went into the DMP. Um, and, you know, as we scaled it up, of course, we, you know, we had, we had also learned through that sort of on the ground experience, which our partners were implementing, how important it was to, you know, to create opportunities to, uh, to engage people around it, because this was a learning, you know, a learning tool. So you would, you could learn about malnutrition and its causes. So it has the frameworks and the, th so the concept of the thousand days, and then the UNICEF Landsat framework are in the DBT itself. You don't need to go somewhere else to find it. So that little bit of theory is in the DBT. Um, and then, you know, you, you can, we had sort of many different facilitated approaches where, where people could use that. So, um, you know, I, I think it was really driven by the purpose of driving understanding of trying to say, okay, if, if I think there are four underlying causes of malnutrition or undernutrition, which is what we were focused on, I want to make sure that I have space in the DBT for people to appreciate that there are four clusters of causes, uh, but also to appreciate that you may not, not have all the data you need uh, on all of those. So, you know, that's broadly how, how we, we went about it. Uh, and we've done a lot, you know, since 2012, 13, when we started, you know, we've built entire training courses for district administrators that, that use these DBTs. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a very interesting, very interesting journey. We're actually in the process right now of developing a version 2.0 um, because for the first time uh, we are, we're going to have trend data uh, at the district level of the same survey, uh, the National Family Health Survey. And so we've been going through this massive exercise of revisiting the indicators, um, you know, also aligning with the, with the monitoring framework and prioritized indicators of the national nutrition mission. And, you know, it's, it feels like uh, it's a bit, you know, it's a big churn sort of doing a lot of mapping of, okay, that's the master list of indicators. How many frameworks does it show up in? You know, can we get the data on everything we need? You know, which ones are gonna have data on trend? You know, so where can we actually uh, show a trend in, in a certain indicator? And you know, like like Sean said, I mean, we really want to focus not on trend and in malnutrition because we think this is too short a time between when you know the massive efforts started to sort of really scale up a lot of interventions in India to um, uh, you know when the data is coming in. So we we want to take a lot of time to get people to focus in on coverage and on coverage indicators and to look at trends in in coverage because we do believe that when you're looking at timeframes of say two years from when a big effort launched, you're more likely to see shifts in, in coverage than you are uh, in outcomes. So it's just, you know, it is a big exercise to think about, you know, but it's focused on, on enhancing learning and maybe doing strategic diagnostics. This is not an immediate action oriented tool that has monitoring indicators in it. It's not going to come, you know, every two months it's going to be there. It's going to be there for your district until the next round of data comes up. And in that, you know, in that period, a lot of people will have a chance to look at nutrition in that geographic uh, location, in a sense, hopefully through the, you know, through a, a lens that, uh, you know, gives a lot of people in that geography, a collective understanding of the multisectorality of the problem. So this has been our thinking behind doing that. And that's how we've been thinking about pulling indicators. And um, yeah, it's been quite an interesting uh, experience. <laughs> Thank, thanks a lot. And it seems you have a lot on your plate with the new, uh, the new survey data coming out now. And then, you know, kind of a lot yeah. of 
you know, opportunities to uh, to analyze this and and feature it in in the, in the next generation of of, of scorecards. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know also I think what you are highlighting here about the the focus on on learning is that. You know, we've seen this in the work, the data then work on kind of landscaping nutrition DVTs. Some of them are more focused on accountability and action. Uh, some of them are more, you know, kind of are broader and, you know, kind of focus on, you know, kind of educating and, and promoting learning about particular issues. Uh, but I think that, you know, a comment that I have is, you know, whatever, whatever your, your, your goal and purpose is, it's still important to, and you seem to, you seem to, uh, um, to really have done this, but be clear about who your audience is and, and you know, kind of what is the kind of data that they need. My follow-on question to you, you know, knowing the work that you did on landscaping the various data visualization tools in India, and that there are quite a few, uh, is uh, you know how do we think? How do you think that we, as a nutrition community, you know, can help address you know the mixed messaging uh, that stem from different DVTs that use different definitions and so on. The, the as just to, to repeat Sean's uh, word, um, you know, kind of how to avoid the cacophony. Um, and, you know, what is your experience with the, for instance, with the Bush, Bush and District uh, nutrition <laughs> profiles, you know, kind of in relation to some of the other ones that are out there? Yeah, I, you know, I, I've, I've given up a little bit on avoiding the, you know, the multitude of things. I, I, I think it's, it's, um, it is just simply a reality at this point, not just for India, but across the world. You know, you just, people are interested in some things and they wanna do it a certain way and they have a reason for doing it a certain way and then they have some resources. And at the end of the day, I, I think we're all just gonna to have to accept that there will be some of that. I think, you know, our review, um, you know, has been helpful uh, to, you know, at least some of the people that we have encountered and, and talked to in the DBT. Um, community in India, particularly, you know, folks at the uh, Niti Aayog who designed something called the Champions of Change dashboard. So they took, a, took some insights from the review and all of that. Um, I, you know, I think, it, so, so, you know, where I'm, where I'm going with this is, I don't think we can avoid the cacophony or the, or the fact that different people or different organizations are interested in doing things. Um, but I, I think we can do a lot more to explain the differences. And, you know, I mean, I feel like in India, for example, the DVT landscaping itself needs to be dynamic because I honestly do hear about a new dashboard every so often. And now with the new, you know, with the new data out and with the tools that are available, I mean, it is incredible to me how quickly data moves into the public domain how many people visualize things in how many different ways. And that's just going to be a reality. So, you know, I think there is a core nutrition community that is action focused and that spends perhaps a lot of time with administrators of different levels. And, you know, to the extent that that core community can stay reasonably coordinated and agree on some things, uh, we'll all make, make progress, but there's always going to be uh, sort of additional things. And, you know, the, um, this issue of differences in indicators, yeah, it's funny, I was just reading a, a Twitter thread on this about some of the new indicators that have come out from India, and people are asking all the right questions, you know, it's like, why is early initiation of breastfeeding high in that survey and low in this survey, and so the discussion around it as well, check the wording of the question, check the recall period, you know, what is the, um, the, um, you know, the age windows in which they were asking those questions, the time periods in which they were asking those questions. So I do think that when we do this work and we put it out there and we create those conversations, then people, uh, you know, get more attuned to engaging around that. Um, but it, it's, it's, you know, it's a big, it's a big challenge. And, and I think some of the things are more easy to deal with. So that, you know, you do see, for example, um, what perhaps used to be more private monitoring data and not visible to the public. So HMIS data is now all visible to the public in many, many countries. Um, survey data like the DHS has always been public domain data. But now when you have two pieces of data from the same country, and I, I find that there are bigger discussions around, you know, what does the HMIS mean in terms of indicator definitions versus what does the, you know, the survey data mean? And so I think we need to keep engaging on that conversation today. 
social media and Twitter especially is a great way for, for those kinds of technical conversations to happen. Uh, but beyond that, I, you know, I think the work that you all initiated with the global DBT landscaping that laid out many of those issues um, is, is a very important contribution. And I don't think it's an important contribution just to nutrition because these issues are so pertinent to every single um, you know, part of the data world and data visualization world. Um, so yeah, you know, I hope, hope those are some helpful comments there. <laughs> yes, thanks a lot. No, this is super helpful. I'm just mindful of time and uh, want to make sure that we give the, the floor to, to Paul who deserves special credits uh, for his, his presence in this panel. He's calling from Australia. So we're, we're, we're catching him in the, in, in the middle of the night. Uh, but we, Paul, I hope you don't mind. We kept you for the end because I think that your perspective, where you sit, you know, in the as the SDG two uh, advocacy hub uh, coordinator, you know, you know, is is an ideal place just to comment on the uh, the number of efforts and their quality and their reach and their impact and their their, their usability of different advocacy tools and and so. You know, very curious to hear, you know, kind of your reactions to what has been said and, you know, from your perspective, when and why, you know, some of those uh, DVTs and nutrition food systems, food security are more helpful uh, to support advocacy efforts compared to others. Yeah. Thanks, Augustine. And it's, um, it's great to be here with you guys. Um, so, a, a couple of reflections, I suppose, um, coming at this, I'm not a technical nutritionist or um, deep in the nutrition world in that sense. Um, we're actually looking at SDG2. So obviously nutrition is part of what we're um, looking at and the forms of malnutrition, but we're also looking at food security and agriculture. And so we're looking at how do we connect dots? Um, and how do we advocate within that space? And I think one of the challenges that we, we, we face is there is a huge amount of information um, and, and it particularly starts to get very technical um, and the conversation often is had within the community. And so as you start to look at that, it, it is a challenge. So I think the, the, the recommendations and the presentation are, are really great, actually, because they they really highlight some of the, the the challenges that we face. I also think what what Sean raised is that the tool is a tool, um, and so data visualization is a tool for us to achieve something, and we have to be clear on what the strategy is. And I think sometimes we're not clear on who our audience is, um, who we're what we're actually trying to communicate. We're, we're, and, and so because of that, we have these things overlapping one another. And um, I think, you know, that in the presentation, there was a slide which showed just how many people of the 177 people are actually accessing these, these tools. And it, it's quite scary when you look at it, actually, because of the, the amount of investment, the amount of engagement. And, and that makes me, as an advocate, look at it and say, well, if these are the people in the community not really accessing it, then how have we got hope of getting these tools in front of a finance minister or in front of the right kinds of people that are decision makers out there? Um, and so I think this is a real challenge. And I think it's partly because um, there's a disconnect often. So I think often money is put into doing research, often then money is put into doing reports, but it's not necessarily put into communication or advocacy strategy. And so the, the parts are not necessarily joined up. Um, and so there's a disconnect that happens. And so I think, you know, um, DBTs are often not created to tell a story. They're not really clear on what is the story that you're trying to tell. And, 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 and if you're not clear what the story is, it's going to be very hard to be successful at communicating. Um, if you're not clear on your audience, who you're actually communicating to, and we've talked here everything from detail policy um, uh, people through to governments, then it's very hard to hit that target. And so then it becomes a question of, well, what's interesting, what's attractive? And interesting and attractive is great, but it requires then also still to think about a, a theory of change and what you're trying to say. So I, I think for me, when I, I think about this, um, I think, you know, of the reports that we use the most and, 
And I would say in our space, it's the Sophie Report, the GNR, and, but even within them, it's actually looking at very small sections of what they're trying to get across. And I think it's about, you know, we're looking at well, what's a story that we're trying to tell and how do these, these visualizations fit into the broader narrative? So Sean talked a little bit about um, what he was getting excited about, which was the food system um, dialogue, the dashboards that are coming up. Um, and so the question that I have, you know, for the nutrition community is how does nutrition um, really plug into those things that are getting attention? and not be threatened by them, but be embracing. So to say, well, how do we show the, the, the nutrition information in the context of these without getting lost? And I think a good data visualization really brings out a story rather than actually, and so it can bring out that story of, well, what is it that is there behind? What is it that um, is the connections? And I think it's, it's really showing those connections, which is really critical. I also think it's about thinking about the on and off ramps of this of, of each visualization. How do you how do you do that? And often we're presenting stories to people outside the community, advocates out there. We have a network of chefs. We have um, a lot of groups uh, that we'll talk to that are not technically aware of this space. And it's how do you communicate to them about using terminology, um, imagery that is accessible. Um, and I think data really provides that ability because it shows the relationship between data points. It shows the ability of scale and perspective. We're doing a piece of work at the moment around the complexity of the food system with a group called TSC, and they, they do a lot of stakeholder mapping. And they're showing, we're trying to say, well, how do we show the interrelationships between some of the moments? How do you show some of the interrelationships between the engagement of people? and how those people fit into a system. And the system then as a way of telling the story of what do we need to bring to drive forward change. So I, I don't know if, if, if that's helpful, but um, I, I think uh, the, the presentation was, was incredibly insightful and very timely. I think the, the key then is how do we move that forward? No, that's super helpful. And I think you actually you know, kind of add a couple of recommendations to to those that are in, in in the in the slides. You know, which are you know kind of you know really you know thinking about how to connect dots and and how to plug into uh, bigger themes uh, and 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 bring out the story. And and I, you know there was a, a, a recommendation about visualization, which was very focused on you know in a way on understand the literacy of your audience and uh, and um, you know kind of create a visualization like this, but, but you know, if we think a, a, about the advocacy community as this echo chamber, to, to use uh, Sean's term, um, then you know, that audience, you know, if you want to you create the right visuals, that, as you said, that they can use and, and, and kind of plug into their, their narrative. So it's, it's super helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe one, one follow on for you, you know, based on what you said. Um, so you see a lot of, you know, kind of, advocates using more or less different different tools how can producers of tools you know help advocates understand and you you understand better and use their tools uh, what would you want them to do more of you know to help advocates do their job yeah look i think um, it obviously depends on the audience that the advocates are focused on and so in in different audiences you need to you need to cater and shape the the story that you're telling in the data but i think um, i would say in general one thing that we need to do more of is to try and show relationships between points of data um, to be able to show the 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 connection points I also think we need to take jargon and technical language out as much as possible. Obviously, unless you're going to a very technical audience and that's, that's fine. But I think the visualization, good visualizations um, are beautiful in the way that they, they communicate. And, and I think it's thinking about how you do that. And so less is more. I was, I've got a I've got a book that um, I've been I, I read often, which is this. It's it's just about information and how do you organize information. But some of the most powerful graphics in this book, and it's a book to try and tell stories and almost tell. They, the author talks about 
can I tell jokes using data? Can I engage you with that, with using very little words? And it's like font size, you know, and it's like four lines on one page with blank pages actually communicates hugely a point. And I think sometimes we cram too much in. So I think the producers of these visualizations need to use design principles. They need to use best in class design principles about how do you get across a single point? How do people's eyes read across a page? Um, how do people um, take in information using the different, you know, intelligences and the way people learn? And, you know, there's a lot of things around the psychology, um, around how we engage. And if you, you know, um, we, we were talking uh, about, you know, um, Twitter and other elements, you know, the amount of time people spend on social media engaging in content, it moves very, very fast. And for them to stop, there's certain things that captures their information. You know, like we've been thinking, how do we use things like TikTok more? And, you know, it seems crazy, but you're starting to go, how do we do that? Now in the political realm, it's, they're already there. And so if you think about that, how are we getting into that space and bringing these technical, well-researched pieces of work, but making them much more bite-sized, making them much more accessible, making them much more attractive. And so I think that's a real challenge for producers. Um, and it's a real challenge for us as a community to think, how do we do that without simplifying our message or losing the depth of message, but really at the headlines is to get those, those simple messages out. Thanks a lot. I, I really like the, uh the call to use design principles. And uh, one of our collaborators on, on Data Dent, uh, Tricia Ong, is the, uh, she's part of the, um, I think it's called the Data Visualization Society, or it's a good, an association that focuses precisely with some professionals on, uh, you know, kind of how the mind, the, how, how we read data, how the eyes, you know, kind of gets more attracted by certain things, how people read or don't read colors, you know, kind of colorblind folks, you know, with, look at all these slides with, uh, you know, with colors, uh, which is the, the way of conveying the information, et cetera, et cetera. So thanks a lot for this. We have, so first of all, thanks a lot to all of you. Uh, we had a lot of great points and we have a lot of uh, questions and reactions from, from the audience. Um, so let me, let me kick off and we'll go through uh, as many as we, as we can. Um, the first one, which I think, you know, echoes or, or, or follows up on uh, a point that was made by, by Sean, but was also kind of underpinned a lot of the points that were made by others, you know, which is how to facilitate coordination with other DVTs. Uh, this is from Kendra. Um, you know, as one of the uh, collaborators on the development of the Sun Meal DVT, I know that we made choices on the indicator definition with a clear advocacy angle in mind. And she, she says an example, you know, emphasizing ORS plus zinc, uh, because this is how the intervention is optimally delivered. Um, but it's hard to show all this, uh, all this thinking behind the DVT in the tool itself. Um, and this is not what other DVTs are doing. And so any thoughts on how to push these types of advocacy agendas more effectively without confusing the target stakeholders or appearing to be inconsistent with other uh, DVTs like the GNR, um, and I will maybe uh, direct this to uh, Purnima um, and and Sean if you have if you have answers to that. Sean, do you want to go first? <laughs> he directed it to you first, so I was going to build on your words of wisdom, Purnima. <laughs> um. Well, you know, I, um, this is complicated in, in the sense that, you know, I, I don't think we should ever assume that we can just put a piece of data out there and it's going to work without some conversation around it. Because, you know, you put something out there and there's usually, you want people to walk through some kind of cognitive process if you're going to get an advocacy or some other kind of outcome. You know, For me, for example, with the district profile, it's a learning outcome and understanding some of the other action-oriented DVTs, there's a, there's a real ask somewhere. And so in a sense, the, the, the tool itself or the DVT itself 
um, there has to be enough, I think, built around it to be sure that, you know, as people see what's in there, there's enough, uh, you know, around it and around what's asked of them in the context of advocacy that you can walk that path. So, you know, I, this issue of ORS and zinc is, you know, is, is great, um, but not everybody understands that fully, although I think today, you know, between the diarrhea world and the nutrition world, which are very, you know, connected, but not always connected, people understand what the ask is over there. It's, it's, it's quite clear. But for other things, I, I think we have to build in people time. We have to build in engagement. If you want to get to action or get to, uh, you know, some kind of an ask. Um, otherwise, it's some, it's another pretty looking thing that's out there, and it um, just depends on the viewer. You know, they may enjoy looking at it, but is it going to lead somebody to action? Um, they're going to have to think about that. Yeah. So I'm not going. I'm not sure I'm going to exactly respond to the question, Augusta, but. I was really struck when Melanie was presenting, thank you very much for that, on the Alma scorecard, scorecards. What struck me is, was that the starting point was legitimacy. And because the heads of state had asked for it, there was a real legitimacy. And I, I see some parallels with uh, the African Leaders for Nutrition and the Continental Nutrition Accountability Scorecard. It started somewhat differently, but I think it was very inspired also by the experience of Alma because it was a meeting of the minds uh, between President Kufour, the former president of Ghana, and uh, President Adesina of the African Development Bank saying, look, we need to bring nutrition, we need to bring heads of state in Africa, make them aware of nutrition, et cetera. And I say that because that, that co-design, co-development with your core audience seems to be the most important thing. So maybe I'm adjusting my thinking a little bit during this panel of maybe the cacaf. I mean, if, if we have a clear target audience, that's what one that, and that we're understanding this is just one tool, then perhaps that harmonization across other tools is less important. Uh, I don't think, I mean, I do think that there are a few standards out there that we probably want to use as references. At the end of the day, probably the data sources are, are quite similar. Um, I was also struck, and I was wondering, just looking at that one slide that, that was put up about consultation, I was on one hand very pleased to see that the Global Nutrition Report was consulted so frequently. And I was quite to wonder, is that, does that, is that because it had a certain level of legitimacy coming out as a commitment of the Nutrition for Growth Summit in 2013, the way it brings together so many actors. But I think that question of legitimacy is so important in this process of, you know, because who are we to hold people accountable, right? You need to have, there has to be some legitimacy in whoever is starting this process and driving this process. So I sort of skirted your question, the question, Augusta, but, uh, it's uh, an interesting discussion of how much, you know, do we focus? Because to me, one of the takeaway messages here is very clearly that this is one tool. We need to hold, think of the whole system. Who's our audience? I mean, what do we want to change? Who's the audience to change that? What do we need to do to engage them to change that? And these visualization tools are one part of that toolkit. Thanks, I totally agree with this. And it, it is your prerogative to reframe the, the question in, in, in your answer. Um, moving to the uh, next question uh, we, from Noreen. We have, uh, she's asking uh, if anyone has any DVD, good DVT examples for more humanitarian emergency settings. It's true that a lot of the ones that we've discussed and talked about are more for development settings. Uh, and so to the panel and Yasho, um, if you if you want to sp speak up also, uh, please do um, any any examples of good uh, humanitarian emergency setting DVT.
I will I will take silence as a as a as a lack of example from anyone, which I think is a is an interesting finding in itself. Um, one, I two, would three. Say, Go ahead. Oh, there, there's things like the WFP hunger map, which have been really interesting. There's some interactive uh, work that's being done by by WFP that's interesting around showing predictive analysis as well around weather patterns and um, water and things like that around humanitarian um, response that I think is quite good. But um, if people hadn't seen that, 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 that would be worth having a look at. Thanks, thanks a lot, Paul. Um, let's, let's, let's move on to the next question. Um, so that's from Akil. Um, thanks a lot for your amazing presentation. Uh, for effective DVTs, there's a large problem of having too many things of visuals on it, and it's hard to effectively represent the data. How can we present uh, the most important indicators while still showing all the data that is available? I think you know the question is how can you have your your cake and eat it? Um, let me maybe. Uh, Ask the question to to Melanie. You know, how do you you know how do you navigate those trade offs, uh, Melanie and and Hanima, who are um, working on DVTs? Um, yeah, it's a good question, and and it's always the difficulty when you. I can still remember the very first country scorecard we supported. The partners in the country came with four hundred and fifty indicators to the table. And we had to pressure test those down to 20. Um, and it's about an understanding as well that there are proxy indicators that can cover a number of areas and drive action. So having um, an indicator for reproductive health, for maternal health, for newborn health is enough in many ways to have that representing that whole core area and drive progress against um, the entire kind of um, maternal health agenda, because just by highlighting one proxy indicator, it can very much drive, oh, we've got a problem here. Oh dear, let's let's invest in this. What are some of the broader issues we can we can cover? So um, not to worry too much about we there was a lot of fighting at the start of the scorecard, especially the country scorecard process, where everybody wanted their favorite indicator included. What we do map out though is waves of indicators. So you start with a set, wave one, those are all live, but then you have wave two and wave three, and sometimes wave four all waiting for introduction. So either as and when data become better or more available or a new intervention that's an absolute priority is being introduced and or when the other indicators have gone fully green, um, it allows you to transition to a whole set of new indicators over time. And some countries systematically update their, have a, have a changeover of the indicators in their scorecards of more than 50% annually. Um, and that's another way of, allowing a broader range of indicators to to enter into the scorecards and then actually to leave and have other ones coming in. Yeah, I, I would just say coming back to the, um, that was a, a, such a great response, by the way, Melanie. <laughs> so I don't have so uh, too much more to add, but you know, just to say, I think this is just a very important question. Um, and we just have to keep going back to, to purpose uh, you know, I, I think there's also, we're also in a very different world today, you know, in the sense that you can have these layers of indicators. So it's almost a question of, you know, deciding which ones uh, do you look at first to create a sense of, you know, either curiosity or engagement that asks people, you know, then leads people to look a little bit deeper if they would like to. Uh, so I, I think, you know, it's, it's going to take a lot of work, but um, really doing the background work to understand, you know, to, to sort of bring clarity to your own purpose for the DVT or the area in which you're, you're aiming to design a DVT and then spending time to have conversations with other people, but also thinking through, you know, how much can we do to support people's understanding, you know, if you're going to use something that's a little bit more complicated. So I'm, you know, Melanie, I'm in the middle of you know, we, we have this sort of big indicator landscape and now for many of them, we have 
indicators over time, um, you know, which ones to choose to show where. Uh, so I think it's more, you know, how do you choose the right ones to show early in the engagement process? So that creates a deeper engagement with it. That's going to be the challenge in a world of electronic dashboards and the ability to help people go deep if they want. And a lot of people want to go very deep. You know, I, I have found that when in the learning space that we use our DVTs, people often want more data once they engage around it. It's like, well, why don't I know more about this? And why isn't there information available on that? Are you telling me I don't know anything about food security in my district? And, you know, that's, uh, it creates uh, a lot of interest in data as well. <laughs> so, yeah, very, very, uh, very good question, Akhil. Thank you. A lot and and thanks a lot for this this great responses to a difficult question. Um, I think we're we're getting to the end of the uh, the, the questions in the um, in the in the chat and Q and A, and so we can we can slowly wrap up. Um, and and maybe before we do so, I want to in, first of all thank a lot each of our panelists, uh, but also invite you to share um, uh, a last thought if you have any on on the discussion today um, and um, and um, what it means for for, for your work uh, and let's start with uh, with Paul since you came last in the uh, in the presentations yeah thanks Augustine I mean to me this is um, this has been a, a, a very interesting conversation and, and the review is very helpful I think one thing that I would say is um, I think the first question in looking at DVTs is, are they needed? Um, and, and what can you do to connect dots? Um, is, there, is there DVTs that are looking across different uh, reports and trying to kind of connect the dots? Because if you're thinking from an advocate's perspective, we need to have clarity on, on what, on where to engage. And I think, you know, Sean, you raised the, the question about the Global Nutrition Report and why maybe that has more legitimacy than something else. I think partly it's also things like name. Um, it's called the Global Nutrition Report. And so it, it just through that almost it's for people outside the community, they go, well, let's go there first, even though the data behind it, and I, I know it is very robust, but it, for somebody outside, we might not know that. And so I think there's a legitimacy that comes from, from the name but I also think a lot of work would be how do you then compare dots? And so if that's the one that appears more legitimate, then it's like, okay, well, how do other figures stack up? And when, when they use different methodologies or different, term, different approaches, different traffic light systems, it becomes very confusing. And that's when you lose people. So I think, you know, just looking at consistency, looking at how you build um, connection do we need DVTs? You know, it might just be one or two for a, a report. That's all that's needed. Um, and then it's thinking about how you build on others. Thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, Purnima, do you want to come next? Yeah, you know, just, just as we've been talking about uh, people needing support to, to engage with DVTs, um, I, I think we need to think quite hard about what is it that the, this community is going to do or what is it that we're going to be able to do in nutrition because there is a lot of interest in nutrition. And this is coupled with the, with the fact that a lot of data is available in public domain and a lot of da data visualization tools like Tableau, et cetera, are available. So people can do all kinds of things, but they don't actually understand the subject matter and they don't understand what indicators mean to the subject matter. So I think for me, there's two things here, right? One is how is a you know how can we a take forward what you've learned on the DBTs, but also situate that in the context of nutrition um, to help people who want to do this, but you know could just do with that little bit of help. So I'm you know I I, I want to go back and keep looking at the at the work that all of us have done to say you know am I applying those principles and how you know, we ourselves are doing the next round <laughs> of these profiles. So I, I think, you know, this is a huge, huge need, um, especially in a world where both working with data and visualizing it and putting it out in public domain has become so much 
easier for people. Thanks, Pranima. Yeah, for a cacophony. <laughs> Thank Melanie, you. Melanie, over to you. Um, so I think this has been a really, a really great session. So thank you for inviting me. Um, I think keep it simple. Um, and then I often have a conversation probably about once a week with someone wanting to establish a scorecard. And I'll ask, who is it for? What is it for? What do you want to achieve? And the number of times they can't answer those three simple questions is, is quite surprising. So um, I always ask them to go away and think about it and then come back. Often they don't come back um, because they haven't been able to well enough describe what it's for and who it's for and what they want it to do. Um, and the other thing is around the data. Um, if the data aren't good enough, they don't have to be fantastic, but they have to be good enough to um, drive change. Um, but they have to, you have to have confidence in them. And if you end up discussing the quality of data all the time and not the actual action, drop that particular data piece and move on to something that is less controversial. And then um, I think my main message is the action part is the important part. It's not just about a, a tool where you can say, oh dear, that's not looking good. And then you see it again the next year um, as, as much effort, if not much more on, on the action action part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie. Sean, over to you. Yeah, I must say, no offense to anybody else on this panel, but what I've appreciated most is hearing from Melanie because I think there are huge lessons we as nutrition can learn from what uh, Alma has been doing. And I, and I underscore that because going back to what one of the questions was, I think, you know, we as nutritionists are trained to revel in our incredible complexity, the multi-sexual nature, and then we want to put it all out there. And that just drowns decision makers. And I think that ability, I mean, we need to discipline ourselves to say, you know, we actually need to start a conversation and think of this as progressive realization. So you engage the decision maker, not the entire, everything you need to do for nutrition, but what are a few things that are actionable? And in fact, you're building these long-term relationships. And that's what I've taken away from Melanie's presentation is that this, this has been a long-term relationship and the tools you needed have changed over time. And, the, and, and, and really think of it that way of hook them, keep them engaged, and work with them and hold them accountable. Uh, and you can't hip hook them by beating the overhead within the total complexity, you need to everything all at once, everywhere for everybody, uh, you're gonna lose people. So um, really thank you for organizing this and thanks for the panelists. I think I, I certainly walking away having learned a lot. Thanks a lot, Sean. And and, and I want to give the, the last word to, to Yasho who, you know, started us started us off with her presentation. You know, any uh, any key takeaways from you? Any final thought that you want to share? Um, I think just one thing to add from my end, Augusta. In addition to doing the landscape, we've also been, as you know, involved with the Nigeria Governors Forum and actually developing a nutrition scorecard. Uh, so we've had time to apply some of these recommendations in action, and the amount of effort and time it really takes to get a tool like this, right, is so enormous that, you know, for me, the really, the starting point is, do we really need it? And who's going to use it? So I echo that comment again and again, because it's not just enough to have a really cool looking scorecard with complex diagrams out there. But, you know, you, you have to ensure that someone is seeing it, is processing it, and then doing something with it. And so for me, that's, that's been a big takeaway from having invested a whole year in developing that scorecard of saying, let's make sure something is coming out of it. So I would just end with, again, that starting point of, do we need it? And what's the unique value add of, of the DBT being considered? Thanks a lot, Yasho. And, and I, I, just, I just close with a few uh, words that we, we heard from you, uh, from you all connecting dots, situating uh, the, the issues within you know, the, the, the broader um, landscape, keeping it simple, action, action, actions. And DVTs are tools for relationships, which I, I think is a, is a, is a really, really deep uh, insight as well. 
So I want to leave the um, the everyone with those. Uh, those last words from, from all our panelists. Thank you very much again to our panelists for making, um, uh, coming and joining the panel and, and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you to our audience for um, uh, engaging with great comments and questions. Uh, please, you know, you have you know, access to all the material on the Data Dan website. Uh, feel free to reach out and ask further questions. We're happy to, to answer them. And thank you very much for the Data for Nutrition Committee of Practice for hosting this webinar and to Riley for kicking us off. And bye everyone and happy holidays. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Bye. Everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye everyone. Bye.